All right, hello everyone. My name is Lee Heinemann. I um, am an artist in residence in education at the BMA, and um, I am very grateful for everyone who came to this join me for this amazing conversation uh, between Dr. Lester Spence and Dr. Mackenzie Wark. And uh, just the kind of basic um, overview of how this came together is um, hopefully you had a chance to see DIS, A Good Crisis, um, an exhibition by the collective DIS, which is here in the museum. And um, this is the first of three conversations that will kind of pick apart uh, issues brought up in the show and issues that are very pressing to our current political moment and our um, many crises that we find ourselves in now. Um, and I will be kind of your resident non-expert throughout um, these, these three uh, lectures. And so uh, I'm really like learning um, along with you, hopefully, or catching up to where you're at. Um, so for tonight, um, we're really going to just jump right into conversation. And there's, uh, this is a conversation far too rich for one hour. So we're going to try to just like get a lot, a lot into the time that we have. And we hope that you'll, uh, you'll engage with us through that. Um, I would like to ask that everyone be, uh, when we do turn it over to questions from the audience or, or requests for clarification from the audience, please just be uh, aware of uh, being as succinct as possible and as generous to the others in the room as possible. And uh, we will all lead with our curiosities there. Um, and, so, and also please pop up if there's if we're moving too quickly or there's something that you want more time um, spent upon. Um, and something that I think is a really lovely framing for, for this conversation as the first in this series and uh, something that both of these scholars and, and DIS as art practitioners do is um, really earnestly try to bring the, the issues um, most pressing to our moment to as broad an audience as possible or package in a way that can be shared broadly. Um, and something that uh, can kind of lead us into the introductions and the conversations is um, this, this thought that kind of frames Mackenzie's um, book that we'll kind of use as a jumping off point, uh, this idea of like a partial totalization and uh, this thought that a lot, of the, um, a lot of the ideas that are out in the world can seem like they're fighting each other or fighting for, for dominance over each other. And uh, what we're here to do is kind of take what works from these worlds that thinkers have built and use what we can, uh, make connections where we can. So that's kind of where we'll begin this. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce tonight um, our panels. Mackenzie Wark is a professor, scholar, and writer of media theory, critical theory, and new media. Among her many books are Hacker Manifesto, Gamer Theory, The Beach Beneath the Street, and her newest publication, Capital is Dead, will be released next month um, on Verso Books, correct? And uh, this spring, Mackenzie Work was awarded the Carl and Marilyn Thoma Art Foundation's Art Writing Award in Digital Art in recognition of her sustained dedication to the field as an established arts writer who challenges the value systems of internet culture. Sorry, that has to be in the bio for me to have got the money. It was in, it was in the contract. <laughs> I think it's worth mentioning. <laughs> She is a professor of culture and media studies at the New School, School for Social, Social Research and Eugene Lane College in New York City. And Lester Spence, professor of political science and Africana studies, is an award-winning scholar, author, and teacher, and has published two books, Stare in the Darkness, Hip Hop and the Limits of Black Politics, the winner of the 2012 W.E.B. Du Bois Distinguished Book Award, and Not King the Hustle Against the Neoliberal Turn in Black Politics, winner of both the Baltimore City Paper and Baltimore Magazine 2016, 
Best Nonfiction Book Awards and was named the Atlantic's 2016 Best Book We Missed. <laughs> That's in the contract. Should I miss it? <laughs> in the contract. <laughs> on, on sale outside. We found it now. And uh, Dr. Spence's work has been published widely across uh, the American Journal of Polit Political Science, the New York Times, Salon, the Boston Review, among many others. Lee, Lee, this is Baltimore. I know a lot of people know you. I, this is Baltimore. Some folks maybe don't. It's good to, I just want to gas you up a little bit while I can. Um, and so. Imani already gave you the check. <laughs> with that. I'm ready to jump right in. We um, can kind of move through this uh, as, as makes sense for the conversation, but what brings us together is that Mackenzie is featured in a video in Dis's exhibition where she talks about um, a chapter in her most recent published book, General Intellects, that looks at the work of Chantal Mouffe, uh, still living, a uh, Belgian political theorist, and kind of brings some core ideas from Mouffe's work to an American political context of the contemporary moment. And so both in Mackenzie's work and Lester's work, there's some kind of defining and redefining of the political terms that float around a lot of these conversations. So I was hoping that we could begin with talking about some kind of uh, common understandings of the terms we'll be using this evening, particularly democracy and liberalism, and then neoliberalism, which are kind of the themes under which we've gathered. Uh, so a little bit of context. Uh, I think we both share an interest in how do uh, certain kind of con concepts flow between academic and non-academic spaces and, and what would be good protocols for that. So I think we have that uh, kind of interest in common. Um, I, I personally think of uh, there being a particular value to thinking conceptually. And a shorthand for this would be to say, uh, look, a good fact is mostly true about something in particular. A good concept is slightly true about a lot of things. And, and it's a way of grabbing things by the handful, but the slightly true part's not to be forgotten. The, you know, I don't think concepts aren't some master key sovereign way of thinking. They're just ways that you can get out of the detail a bit and try to perceive connections that aren't otherwise there. Uh, and in the work that ends up in the, uh, the disc video, uh, you know, it's like, what if you try on a particular conceptual lens that has a, a view on everything, but it will overlap? There's, there's no one you can take to be sovereign and dominant over the other. So for me, that was, was kind of key. And the other thing I just like to say about the, is that, there only one of the videos in the show? Or they do all three? There's three that we did together. Yes, I, I think the move video is the only one in the yeah, show. Okay, so there's one of the three. The book has 20 different theorists that I wrote about, and then we did three uh, for this, and then one of them's in the show that I, have to, I can't watch it anymore because it was me before I started gender transition. So I just really can't, I can't even, you know, I can't even would be happy. But, 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 but the, the work that Dis did, I think, is super interesting. I, I kind of support it. All right, so let's just talk a little bit then about two concepts, uh, liberal democracy, and we tend to run it together, right? Uh, so, oh yeah, we live in a liberal democracy. Uh, what I thought was interesting in the Chantal Mouffe political theory perspective is like, what if they're completely incompatible? the liberal and the democracy are completely in tension and pull apart, then how would one think the, uh, the tension between the two? And the shorthand of it would be, uh, the principle of liberalism are, is the defense of the individual's right to own property. So there's a kind of universalizing uh, gesture that, that formally at least can sort of treat everybody as an individual, but only in the context of the possession of property and the essential discussions about its, its defense. But that's then sort of in tension with any concept of democracy uh, that for move very much means uh, a collective that gathers, and th this phrase I think is key, around a shared substance. And that substance can be kind of somewhat abstract and notional, but there's a sense of who gets to participate 
in a substance, in a something. The problem with that is that unlike with liberalism, it has boundaries. And then it immediately starts to have a, well, who is the us that gets this substance and who's excluded? Which is then at odds with the presumed uh, universalism of the liberal. Uh, and then there might be different versions of what, what's the demos and what's the substance. You can have your, let's just say, for example, Bernie Sanders version, which is, we have all this wealth. Why don't we have free education? Why don't we spend our money on housing people uh, and health for people? Because that's shared substance, and we should do that. But there's a way in which there's a different version of what the democratic substance is, which would be something like, the democratic substance belongs to white people and nobody else. And you can see where we went with that. Uh, and you can see how there's a kind of way that this tension flows through both sides of the whole, are you a Democrat, are you a Republican, are you a liberal, are you a conservative kind of discourse. Uh, so it struck me as useful to kind of go, ah, you could use a concept to repartition it in a different way and go, there's a way that the tension between liberal and democratic gets played out in left and right political discourse in the United States. And, and you get to get a different perspective on it, and that's what a concept should do, yeah? And so kind of for the purpose of, of the video that's in the show, uh, you kind of use move to define liberal, uh, or a liberal per perspective as kind of being in favor of capital, or upholding these kind of uh, capital capitalistic structures, and then a democratic perspective being more like an of the people, but where there's an us and a them. And where the crucial question is which people, how, how do you define who has access to common substance, then becomes this crucial uh, and, and frankly fatal uh, mm -hmm. uh, juncture that you get at and within the constant recurrence of fascism as the way to finesse that to defend capital without liberalism, which mm -hmm. is where we are again, yeah, arguably. So one of the things I, uh, one of the things Mackenzie does in that video is uh, she troubles the friend and enemy distinction by adding a couple of more concepts, right? There's the friend and enemy, then there's the non-friend and the non-enemy, right? And, and, and one way, and you can think about that as a way to kind of go outside of the left-right dynamic where you've got Sanders again saying that, the, that us is working class and them is the wealthy, and then you've got, uh, in this case, somebody like Trump saying, us is the domestic white, uh, and then them is the foreigner. But, what I, but one of the reasons that most of my work deals with black politics as opposed to racial politics is because I'm interested in that, I'm interested in a binary that we haven't taken as, much, as, as serious within black spaces and within cities like Baltimore as, as perhaps we should. And I think uh, a figure that really articulates that in this current moment is the, that of the squeegee boy. Right, so for those of you who don't know, the squeegee boy is the, is the kid who's at the corner with the windshield wiper uh, wanting to wipe your windshields while you have a red light and then in exchange you, you give them money. Uh, so what's happened over the past, now, in 1985, uh, right around the time that ba Baltimore's population started to decrease and Baltimore's black percentage started to increase, they passed a law illegal, making that process, making that dynamic illegal, right? And not only did they make it illegal, but it actually had a punishment. Uh, people fought against that, like, oh my God, it's racist, you're only doing this against black boys, which they were. So they got rid of the punishment, but it's still illegal, right? Uh, so what's happened just over the course of, the, I think, the past few weeks maybe, is a group of uh, business owners and corporate leaders, I think, wrote a letter to the mayor, the black mayor, Bernard Young. It's like, listen, we need to do something about these squeegee boys. Right? So he's now articulating this project to deal with the squeegee boys. Now if we, take about, if we think about this from a black politics lens, that is we only think about black people, it's clear who the us and the them are. Now we can trouble that, and I think your work is helpful for a number of reasons, but, in one, but we can trouble that using that lens, the friend, enemy, non-friend, non-enemy, 
But to a certain extent, within black politics, it's actually still worth talking about what that us and the them are, right? Because it's clear that there are a number of black folk in the city who actually want what the black mayor is doing done. Just as, just as there are a number of black folk in the city who want the police to do exactly what they're doing, right? So, it, so one of the terms that you asked us to define was neoliberalism. So when we think about neoliberalism, what we're talking about is a set of public policies that reduce the ability of labor to organize, that significantly reduce the uh, scope and the size of the safety net, that significantly uh, distribute wealth upward to individuals and the corporations, and then that has with it a really rich and robust state for the purpose of punishing folk, right? And then attending that are a set of ideas and logics that make people want to hustle as kind of a as, as kind of not just a descriptive practice, like, damn, I gotta have three jobs. It's like, be, it's something that they want to do. Like, man, I need to get this third job. I gotta get my hustle on, right? And so we can think about the squeegee boys weirdly as being part of the us and that they're getting their hustle on. All they're doing is working, right? But it's still part of a them in that they're engaging in a, part, in a certain type of labor and a certain type of hustle that, that the powers that we don't want. It's, it's worth asking, in, in what sense is neoliberalism liberal? And it's kind of not in the way Americans usually think of that term, but it is in the way liberal would be used in, in classic liberal discourse. It's about the defense of property. So, yeah, you have property, you want it defended. So liberalism is actually about the police, right? That's kind of central to it, because it's, it's about the defense of individual liberty when that's connected to property. So if you don't have it, but then one can think, how does that uh, uh, pass through categories like race? So if you then start to see different concepts, will give you a little bit like, like some of the lens, but sometimes you need to move between perspectives, I think. Yeah, yeah I think that's right. And Lester, for your project, you kind of broadly define capitalism, or broadly define politics, I mean, um, as kind of uh, as the distribution of finite resources. Yeah, yeah, so with, with, that, with that concept, so I'm a, a car-carrying political scientist, and I think one of, the, one of the challenges, and I never ever thought I'd be in a position where I was defending political science and defending political science from other, from other disciplines. What's happening is that, um, is that we've had this expansion of the concept of politics. In some ways, that's fruitful, but one of, the, one of the challenges of that is that we expand it to the way that it defines everything. And it makes it difficult for us to distinguish um, me, not wearing, you know, me not wearing socks on a podium from actually from scarce resources allocated by the state. Now, they're related. Now, there's a way you can relate them. But what I want to do is kind of be as, as uh, be kind of narrow with that definition, even as I write about popular culture, even as you know, my first book was about how, hip hop. Be, if you're narrow with that definition, it really puts the state and similar structures kind of at the forefront, and it, in a way that allows us to really uh, to uh, to make a certain type of critique that can lead us to change. I'm glad that you're out as a political economist, you know, so I, 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 I gotta come out as, I'm a Volcker Marxist, which is a sub, subset of all that. Uh, but there is, there is this sort of a history to ideas bit of this that's relevant where, uh, you know, Marxism was, was perceived as, as, as vulgarly about the economic and it seemed more sophisticated if one talked about uh, uh, culture and language as having autonomy or also then the political as having autonomy. And that's sort of the, the phase we're still in. Everything is about politics being sovereign. Uh, and given that I'm from media studies, it's like, you know what, that culture thing is a sort of independent area we need to think of in its own way. But I think I'm also with you that it's like, you know what, there's a sort of uh, technical and, and economic and also technical uh, layer that one can uh, not be paying attention to that is not transitive, like it goes in a direction and one needs to kind of figure out what that is. And I kind of think that's, that's the part where I think what we're doing connects. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. And, and, there's a, and, 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 and politics is a, very, is a unique form of human endeavor, right? So, so politics isn't, the, 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 it, it, it's related to everything, but it's a very, it is a very specific thing. And, but, but going back to media studies and cultural studies, it's interesting because one of the figures 
You don't deal with him in general intellects explicitly, but he's in there, is Stuart Hall. Right, because so Stuart Hall's a British scholar who's really formative in creating what we think of as cultural studies. And Stuart is explicit. He was like, "Listen, the reason we actually created this, you know, created this project was because we couldn't understand the rise of Margaret Thatcher without thinking about without thinking about culture." And I think that is really, really important and is really profound. But the challenge is, is what happens when you get to a point where. Um, uh, a billionaire whose name I won't mention, Jay Z. Um, <laughs> you know, w w yeah. when, right? When when we're thinking about that project that he's connected to, as 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 a form of kind of progressive politics, like that that whole political project that was there originally drops out. Yeah, one of one of Stuart's students, Paul Gilroy, is in the book. Oh yeah, uh, but the yeah the the ghost of Stuart came to Australia in 1995. Uh, as a guest of the Australian Communist Party, actually, but, uh, uh, and had a huge impact. And I kind of think uh, academics and intellectuals, you should have your master thinkers tattooed on your shoulder. There used to be a shorthand, and you just go like, right, you know. And I would have Stuart Hall on my shoulder, because I'm, I'm school of Stuart, and I, my work's different. But uh, thinking about what it is that is, what is the political and cultural function of being an intellectual, I have, anything I know about that's from Stuart, and I really want to acknowledge that. So thinking about kind of where we are currently, um, both of your projects that now were published, you know, several months or years ago, uh, do a lot to kind of contextualize these ideas in the moment and the context that we're in. And I'm wondering if we can now step into the present a little bit more and talk um, kind of about strategy. And there, if we if we keep with this. Uh, this MOOF reference that we began with, um, kind of part of her, her world is that um, conflict is, is a permanent condition. We can create institutions to mediate conflict, but really the best we can do is avoid the most heinous and violent parts of our society. And so I'm wondering if we could talk kind of through that idea, and also how do we reconcile that with like a broader utopian vision, um, and like what do we do? This, this was actually social science 101 when I was an undergrad. There are conflict theories and consensus theories. So yeah, you got your marks over there. Now we're gonna talk about Talcott Parsons for six weeks, you know. It's all about consensus and institutions and blah, blah, blah. Um, but I was always like, you know, conflict theory based, like essentially. Uh, and MOVE is kind of useful because it's not only class conflict, there are others, but maybe you lose the class conflict bit of it, a little bit in where political theory went. Uh, and, I, and I think that's a perspective that's really useful to, to get back to. But I think in a way we have to ask, what even are classes anymore? Uh, what are the forces and relations of production that would generate them? Are they classic form of capitalism that was the same as it was in the 1850s and, and but did uh, changes in the technical economic base generate new relations and new kinds of classes. I think one has to really open that question up again uh, to kind of figure out on a conceptual level to then figure out what happens, like if I can say it, when we win. Like I'm from Northern Queens, I got to work for Ocasio-Cortez. What was the coalition that enabled us to completely overturn the democratic machine in, in Northern Queens? And it's uh, Mostly immigrant workers who are doing service work for the city. They're not the industrial working class at all. But then it's people who basically work with information. And it's a mostly wider, more, it's, it's you know, more educated population. And you could say privileged if you want, but then also have $100,000 worth of college debt. So it's those two groups as a class alliance. And this is a move concept she got it from Gramsci to do with articulation. How are you to put these things together? These aren't the same people, but how do you articulate their different and specific interests and experiences in some kind of conceptual frame? Uh, and the, uh, the race politics there is going to be about that this is a majority Hispanic population. Uh, it, it's, it's not uh, politics of race where blackness is central, but it, that is actually also part of the picture. But it's very, very much about this other racial politics that we have to also acknowledge as part of New York City, Baltimore, I don't know, but certainly in the national picture. So thinking, uh, thinking locally, uh, I, so I remember 
what, um, right after the uprising, uh, which itself was the product of, of, a, of a certain coalition, a group of kind of black youth left folk, uh, white, uh, white left folk, um, who basically created a set of institutions, including, uh, and organizations, uh, Red Emma's, who's setting out books in the back, or out, out in the side, there's uh, 2640, as far as the space, there's uh, Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle, Baltimore Urban, uh, the Bait League, uh, the Algebra Project, there are all these groups that kind of create this space, such that when Freddie Gray is killed and is caught on film, um, all these entities can kind of can kind of kind of make that a political event. Now, now one person that another person that uh, that McKenzie doesn't deal with, but I think is in there kind of sort of is Ranciere. You think about Ranciere, right, where politics is not what happens normally, but politics every now and then disrupts, right? It's a thing that disrupts. Right? So that disrupt thing happens, right? Um, and I remember in being engaged in traditional politics after that, because after that we had the mayoral election, and I was actually uh, moderating uh, one of the mayoral debates. And what struck me was that we had like about, it seemed, in fact, it actually seemed kind of presidential, in that we had like 10 or 20 different people running for mayor, right? I mean, it was like this huge group, like 10 people. but the but, the dialogue on what policies we, they undertake had shifted so far to the left, I had never seen anything like it. And we were like, wow, this is a moment where people are talking about a whole range of things. Then uh, Pew gets elected and she vetoes several policies that she said that she was gonna, that she was gonna pass if she was elected. You know, so what, what happens at that point qu quickly is, that what we hadn't, we had, we had the forces, but what we hadn't, what we couldn't really rec reckon with was capital. And powerful institutions like my employer, Hopkins, uh, powerful institutions like, uh, like uh, Under Armour, and, and then development and real estate capital, right, who can basically take that impulse and then basically, basically neuter it. So where we are now is in the process of kind of figuring out ideationally and institutionally what that kind of new pushback looks like and how to maintain the few gains that we've actually been able to make over the last several years. I, I mean, the question I want to ask in the, the book that's coming out soon, which is Capital is Dead, is what if it's not even capitalism anymore, it's something worse to do with how you Firstly, commodify information, but that changes the commodity form. This might all sound a bit abstract, but then it's like, why is something like not just finance, but the whole so-called tech sector all about extracting inequalities of information, surpluses of information that can be monetized one way or another, and then feeding into uh, a kind of prison industrial complex that then reaches into the sort of the pores of everyday life as well, and which is a business. Like one of the forms in which you instrumentalize uh, information for profit is essentially that, is you make incarceration a general condition for the whole social space, unevenly distributed for obvious reasons. So yeah, what if it's not even capitalism? So it changes uh, what the class forces are that are against you, but also what possible coalitions are possible. Uh, and I think what happens to those people whose job is basically, which is probably the job of many people here, you work with information. I haven't made a damn thing in my life, you know, or at least since I was like 25 years old. Like I make information, it's what I do. Um, most of us do. Uh, but the way that it's commodified and into which commodity is a very different thing. So are our interests traditional, petite, bourgeois, middle class interests? Sometimes yes, and how people would think about the squeegee example, that would be a case in point. But not always, and that would be, ah, uh, how do people think about debt? You know, how do people think about, uh, why the real estate industry makes housing impossible in the places where information industries are, where you could actually have a job, yeah? Uh, you want a job in information, you try to get to New York City, but you can't afford to get to New York City, it's a double bind, yeah? So, so I think to sort of change the language a bit, 
Um, the thing is, and, and Marx was great on this, in the sense that we always fight the new revolution in the, in the costumes of the old one. So we, we're using often this language that's sort of like costumes from, you know, like uh, as if it was the Paris Commune all over again, you know, um, which has a certain charm. But maybe we're trying to grapple with slightly different realities. So a question. So uh, in general intellects, uh, there were several different uh, conceptions of capitalism, right? Because people, you know, I talk about neoliberalism. Some people talk about the same formation as advanced capitalism. But some people actually even create a more kind of fine-grained uh, concepts. Like, so uh, <laughs> the dope one was pharma porno capitalism. Like, what the heck? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But there's also, Love it. yeah, but there's like uh, lucid capitalism, semi-capitalism, uh, financial capitalism. And I kept on trying to see the squeegee boy in that, you know, as right. a specific, to be yeah, fair, yeah. as a specific yeah. gender subject, but I kept mm -hmm. on trying to find mm -hmm. him in there. Mm -hmm. So I guess one of my questions would be, you know, how do we think about that? But then also, given that you're making a provocative argument, like what if we've got something that's worse, mm -hmm. what concept do you have to kind of have you come up with to think through what, what this thing we are, we're living? And, and that'd be a nice example where like, like those concepts don't actually help enough with that example. Yeah. So there are perspectives that maybe will help you with something else, but with this they don't. Uh, but I have a second volume of the General Intellects pieces on other people. Uh, I have a chapter on that on Jackie Wang. And oh, the oh, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Like casserole capitalism. Yeah, oh, okay, right. that includes yeah, that's, that's it. That's it. And that would be, and I'm, I'm sort of really just ventriloquizing Jackie and the people that she is quoting and yeah. citing that I won't add the other names. And, and, so yeah. as an aside, giving Jackie a shout out, she is actually yeah. one of the books that should have been out there, but but that's my fault, I forgot. Jackie actually wrote Carcel Capitalism with Baltimore in mind. Yeah. Right, she actually talked about Baltimore as a case. So there are a group of us who are starting to think about Baltimore as a way to think through a certain type of relationship between political economy and identity. Uh, and a number of people in our, are in the audience who've been doing the work in Baltimore Revisited out there. I suggest you pick that up. But carceral capitalism, yeah. it was, as I was reading your right. work, I was like, carceral capitalism, carceral capitalism, racial capitalism. Mm -hmm. right. Exactly, and that, that would, it would include the squeegee guy. The, the other useful bit that it pays attention to is algorithmic policing. What happens when you basically outsource to private, for-profit companies uh, some model of you know where the police are supposed to be and what they're supposed to do uh, and how utterly unreliable that is and there's sort of like a little you know magic trick where the com we believe the computer can't be wrong but you know racism in equals racism out right so you take data from the policing you did the old-fashioned way you stick it in an algorithm you get the same thing out the other end maybe more efficient and that's but, but with a more fine-grained control is the thing that we really ought to be paying attention to and then how does that intersect with things like facial recognition? How does it intersect with the fact that your whereabouts is known to various private companies every single minute of the day if you have a cell phone? Uh, so those would be the things to, to then start thinking. All right, well, you can, you can view that through your sort of uh, Foucault lens as the panopticon, you know, as surveillance and all that. But it's also a political economy. And I think Jackie wants to bring those two things together, as, as you have done as well. And I think that's really where that thinking needs to go. It's not just one thing or the other. So one of the, yeah, you asked us about utopia. I guess, kind of. yeah, so I, I'm kind of, I'm curious about this tension between like working with what we've got and Mouffe definitely talks about inhabiting the systems of neoliberal society to, you know, subvert them or, or work with them and then this kind of urge to imagine something beyond the systems that bind us and kind of how we can flow between those. I also want to create space to hear from those in the audience and we, uh, if you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand and Gamien will come around with a microphone um, or a microphone will make its way to you uh, somehow um, so we can hear from you as well. I mean, you know, there's, there's a famous essay by uh, Frederick Engels on utopias uh, uh, socialism, utopian, and scientific, and it's like, well, scientific was a bust. What about utopian? It's like, like I've worked on that for 20 years. Like, what, what is the value of utopian thinking? Why was it devalued by Cold War liberalism? Uh, when there's nothing more utopian in the bad sense than neoliberalism, right? It's, it's, it's the utopia of private property is the only value. 
And it's like, oh, well, what if we had our own utopias again? Like, let's explore that. But maybe they're in a, a smaller scale. So what's the possibility of the utopian space and time in everyday life? And Lester and I were talking about this, you know, earlier today, and, and I think both of us in very different contexts have the experiences like where you get to dance, yeah, like where, where you get your music and your people, however that's defined, and so for that night in that space, you, you, your body is free, the police are not there, you're not under surveillance, uh, a lot of the rules don't apply, there are other ones that are learned and practiced, so like there are utopian moments in everyday life, but, but how do you think you know, another city for another life based on the possibilities those moments as practices show you is how we could live. So, one of the... Th so, the day before Labor Day every year, uh, there's a group of uh, Baltimore house DJs that got together and created something called Collective Minds. Uh, and it's basically one of the biggest house music picnics on the East Coast. And they bang from about 12 to 8. And there are all types of challenges with that space. It's, it's, most, it's mostly straight and it's mostly cisgendered, right? Um, even though house music itself was is really not anything but it's anything it's anything that's not how it's created house music is gay <laughs> black and gay straight straight black straight black and gay Thank wow, you. straight black no really black <laughs> really black and, and gay but that mo that moment that eight hour moment is a place where bodies that under normal circumstances would be heavily policed don't have to don't have to struggle with that Right. So part of our of our politics, part of our politics is about creating spaces in the here and now where people can live that life and be that way. Right. Um, but the thing is, is part of why I think one of the one of the reasons or one of the ways where where we work can work is that the academy and people who work in it. And then similar institutions, you know, again, like Red Emma's or like BMA, can actually kind of give people a sense of what life can be, right? Not, not just, oh my God, this, what this space can be, right, in a, a specific moment in time, but what life can be, right? Like, uh, how might we arrange a city in different ways? How might we arrange the state? How might we think about citizenship, how might we think about even family, how we think about family formation. So while Mackenzie and I have been talking, you know, Mackenzie's sisters have been calling, right? And when Mackenzie thinks about sisters, Mackenzie thinks about sisters in a way that's very different than the state articulates what that means. Or, or what that word might mean to you, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's like, okay, what, what do we, you know, what can we do to actually create the type of ideas, or, or not to create, but to kind of see the different ideas where they can take. Maybe not now, but when, they're, when, when the moment is right, they can actually, they, they can actually flower. Tracy's got a mic, and yeah. somebody had their hand up. Maybe we want to invite people in. Hello. Hi, everybody. Um, so I took a DNA test, and I'm 100% that bitch who cannot reconcile having a job with my morality. Um, wow. <laughs> Lizzo also <laughs> fucked me up when she did the, 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 the crazy performance at the VMAs with a giant ass on stage. Oh, Lizzo, yeah, yeah. While Dave Chappelle was getting in trouble for talking about the shit. And, and I'm really having trouble with this identity thing which is so closely connected to what you guys are talking about. But I think about, as both of you being in the academic sphere and both being committed to the challenges of how do you take the knowledge of somebody, any of us, who has knowledge that nobody else has and get the relevant portions to other people, I'm, I'm really struggling with it. So I'm just like, I, I'm in a vulnerable spot, sort of curious to you both. I, I work in public health. If I had a, 
20 years ago, it was Zizek. So I went, I went to EGS, which is a weird thing that nobody knows about, but it's this creepy program in Switzerland where you know, I went to see these people who, who said things that blew my mind and changed my life forever and couldn't change back, but then I didn't know what to do with it. Right? So I spent the past 20 years trying to figure out what to do, and I came to public health, but I'm a basic bitch. I'm a white girl who came in. So, so your question is now, what, what do we do? What do you do? I talk too much. Yeah, no, this is, this is great, yeah. I, to me, actually, the, the irreconcilability of theory and practice is actually the point. Uh, there was this sort of classic Marxist model about the unity of theory and practice, but it, that's the, actually not the thing. It's the difference, and the, the energy and productivity of the difference uh, is, is, I think, much more kind of crucial. Uh, I actually have a chapter on Zizek that's in the general intellect. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, that's why I was doing like five minute video versions, you know, but I only have to do three. I didn't get to do the Zizek. Yeah. <laughs> that's true, yeah. yeah that's, that's, that's true. I also do Twitter. <laughs> you do Twitter well. Thank you. <laughs> and and I, I gotta confess, and this isn't a popular part of you know my shtick, but we're losing. Like I, I think we have to understand a series of historic defeats as the condition that we're in. Uh, so it's, it's, and I, I actually think it's a little responsible, like, and there are people I, who are in general intellects who I think do a little too much of this, of kind of like, we shall win! You know, the, the what is it, the arc of justice, yada yada, it's like, no it doesn't, you know, we're losing. And I, and I think we need to take agency about that, and then what are defensive strategies that hold what pieces uh, we still have agency over together. Uh, so that's my day job. Uh, but it's kind of boring, and I don't tell you about it, you know, because it, it really wouldn't be here or there. But uh, now, how do tiny little things stay together? Is is sort of what I actually do, you know. And 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 to go to a, a other comment, you know, how do sisters stay alive? That's the other thing. And and particularly with trans women of color politics in New York City, when I start to learn about that, that is basically all it is about: is how do we not get killed? So that's sort of really. Well, on the one hand, I want to hold on to the possibility of that utopian moment because these things immediately connect. The people who I know whose, whose lives are most vulnerable need that utopian possibility more than the rest of us. So I don't think they're antithetical at all. But one has to also, you know, cop to that dimension of uh, we are losing. It is a carceral state. It is maybe something worse than capitalism. So you hold on to what you can for the moment. Uh, I'm still trying to kind of work with the idea of being a basic bitch and a white girl kind of at the, at the same time, I'm just. Um, so when we talk about Black Lives Matter uh, as, uh, and just talk about the movement for Black Lives broadly, right? One dynamic that people haven't really written about but I think they will is, I talked about the Urban Debate League earlier, right? Uh, so Urban Debate League, really quickly, it's, a, it's, a, it's about, an, it's an attempt to get kids from cities like Baltimore involved in policy debate. Policy debate is a very narrow, white class gendered form of debate where people are arguing back and forth about a policy, you know, whether, whether it's nuclear pro, 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 blah, blah, proliferation or whatever, right? Uh, so what happened was a couple of uh, folk realized like, damn, there's scholarships at play here. If we actually started getting kids into debate, 
using the skills they've already learned in other areas, we can actually get these kids scholarships, get these kids in college, and get them victories, right? Whatever. Once you actually involve them in policy debate, they started to take literatures from all over, including a specific form of theory in black studies, Afro-pessimism, that actually doesn't really allow for political change. Right, they, they believe, the Afro-pessimist, and, I'm, and if this is being videotaped, sorry Jared, I'm, so, I'm, I'm sorry Frank, I'm gonna get this all wrong, but what they basically argue is that racism is, ba is basically systemic and the only way to end and, and there's a specific form of anti-black racism, the only way to get rid of it is to get rid of the whole thing. The, to make a long story short, these kids take this idea, not only use this to change the debate world, but in a number of places, movement for black lives organizations start from urban debate kids, right? So rather than talk about what I do, what I'll suggest is there is actually a role for the academic idea, right? That, so that set of ideas, and it's deep because again, that idea isn't supposed to work politically. That's not, you ask them, that they're like, that doesn't really, but somehow kids in places like Baltimore did that. You don't have leaders, or, leaders of beautiful struggle was created by urban debate kids, right? Adam, Lawrence, and them, they're all urban debate kids. So yes, there are all types of ways we can critique the academy, but what we have to come back to is that there is an independent role for ideas, and if the ideas, or even just the space for learning, is broad enough, kids will take this, or we're talking about kids in this case, but people will take it and go all different types of places. Right? And I think we got I think we got no, can, no, can we no, check no. in with another because I've seen it Can we take like maybe two left. or three questions and then we'll pick through them and do the most we can? Damn, I told you. An hour short, minutes. yeah. It's 721 now. Where, where's Trey? That's a terrific example. Though. Thank you. Trey, no, Trey's I told you they would stay. I told you. Hi. <laughs> so um, I'm from Washington, D.C. And um, I just came here because the word e exclusion, uh, you don't hear the word exclusion. Now it's all inclusion and diversity, diversity and inclusion. DNA is like a new industry, right? And part of it is so that we don't talk about exclusion. Uh, so it's, it's, it's marketing, it's, but as you said uh, about the uh, debate team and getting in the academy and so forth, it's also an opportunity. So if you say in inclusion is a good thing, then why the fuck don't you do it? So, but but you, there's no mechanism for uh, accountability, right? So, and, 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 and to expose it and to show that this is just tokenism. Like American University recently, this new president came in and it's all about inclusion and th now they're gonna have a racism center. But the racism center is only to make sure that they can get away with their racism, right? Oh no, we have a racism. Usually is. You go talk to the racism first, people. No, no, I, I'm not. So, so how to mobilize, uh, you know, just like Martin Luther King said, he said, this is your constitution, do it. That's all we want. We want you to, 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 to practice what you, what you put in your constitution. So it's a fantastic opportunity and, and all kinds of, uh, uh, Performance things can be can be organized around it. Do we have any other questions floating out in the audience? Seven twenty one. We just got to start. Hi. And I guess while that's, I also have a question that I want to throw to you while the mic is traveling. Um, uh, throughout uh, your work, kind of some common pitfalls or misunderstandings that are perpetuated in our in our political scheme are brought up. Are, can you talk about some examples of like, uh, either places where we attach our hopes somewhere that, that is leading us astray or, and I guess I'm saying we broadly as like people like us in the room who, who probably share a lot of politics or share a lot of vision. But lead, leading people astray is my whole shtick. So <laughs> struck by uh, the powerful 
sexual themes that came through in a couple of segments, especially the um, uh, promiscuous, whatever the title was, and the handsome red man and the handsome yellow man. And I must have watched that at least eight times, and I was so distracted by the handsome red man and handsome <laughs> yellow man. I thought the, that's where you're going. That the soundtrack did not come through to me at all. And we haven't, I don't think you've touched much tonight on uh, the sexual themes running through this show. Uh, and yeah, you're and speaking in reference to the disc show. And project. how it relates to what you have been talking about. Oh, gosh. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. So yeah, kind of our task for tonight is to really zero in on one small piece of this, which we'll be doing over the course of two more lectures. But if there's places you all want to go. I am distracted by handsome men, so I'll, I'll <laughs> come to that. Uh, I, my collaboration with this wasn't with that work, so I, I don't think I can speak to that. Mm. Oh, we, we do need to, to think about exclusion a bit, yeah? And, yeah. and to me it's, um, and this is actually a side of Afro-pessimism that informs me, but I, I don't think my opinion on it matters is a thing that I have to qualify it with. But who, who is excluded from the possibility of social life at all yeah. is a question that they raise that I think is really, really pertinent. Mm -hmm. no, no. And is it exclusion from, uh, is it a social death or is it a civic death is then a distinction that uh, Jackie Wangman wants to make, like what forms of exclusion are here and how do you account for agency if you're saying that there's a loss of the possibility of being that's in that case attached to blackness. I think there are other, there are other kinds of exclusion. To what extent are, it, it's up for debate whether trans people are people, right? So that's, that's when you're excludable is when your possibility of being a subject is something that has to be discussed. Yeah, and, and, and it's interesting because I, I Again, thinking about uh, those of us who want to think about this stuff through the lens of political economy, it, it wasn't until our conversation that I really realized how different a population trans folk are. That they don't really political economy is there, and as much as, for example, if you want to, uh, if you want to transition, it costs resources. But as far as like the squeegee boys are visible, right? In in a, in a way, in a way that trans men and women, they they it's not. The visibility dynamic doesn't work the same. It just doesn't work the same way. And I, I, hadn't, I hadn't had to think about that. Um, I mean, just an example, uh, my hormone therapy is not really designed for a transition. It's repurposed from other purposes. All of the studies are based really on other needs. Why is it not studied as too small a market? And yeah. sisters are broke. I mean, apart from me, I'm privileged. Yeah. But sisters are broke, so there's no point in investing in it. So the political economy of that starts to matter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, um, and, and shout out to brothers and others who are trans as well. Like, the sisters is just the only one I can speak to. Uh, so I'd go a different way with the American University example, because I actually did a, a we had a conversation. Uh, Ibram Kendi is the person, is his racism center. He's the one who created it. Uh, my critique, so yes, American universities create stuff to kind of uh, create entities like that to, uh, to make people feel good in some ways. There's a problematic politics. Um, my, what I would do rather, or alongside of that, is also talk about the politics of the institute itself, right? So what strikes me about that project is how deeply religious and therapeutic it is. And if you have, like if you look at the website, <laughs> it has a space for anti-racism confessionals. Whoa. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and that, and, and that makes, one of the things I'm, 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 I'm scared about in this moment is I'm really scared about the way that we've talked about uh, dealing with racism, dealing with sexism, dealing with homophobia uh, in therapeutic terms, right? Like, like we have to, you have to be taught out of your racism, you have to be taught out of your privilege. I think that dynamic is about as anti-political as you can get while it's still kind of being political. Right, because you can't, because the, the logic is, is that, getting back to move, the logic is, is that you can actually reduce that political, t you can erase that political tension if we just teach people, if blacks teach, teach whites, probably for the binary, if blacks teach whites, if women teach men, if gays teach straights, if we just teach them 
then we'll reduce the, the, the tension and we'll all, be, we'll all be okay. We'll get to that utopia. And, that's how, and that ignores class totally and that has certain types of political consequences. The other thing that I, I think we're doing too much, I actually don't believe in hope. I, I, I think I don't, uh, I mean, I hope that Mackenzie gets her train on time, but you know, I, I don't really think hope works like that. And I think we're putting too much stock in that. Yeah, and that was just, you know, my political experience was, was very much, it's like it's when things are bad is when you know who your real comrades are because the opportunities melt away, and there's actually something useful about that, I have to say, you know. But it, it, that's perversely finding hope in the, the pessimistic moment that, that you kind of know a little bit more who you can trust. Mm. Well, I hate to end it here. Yes, this is great. But, <laughs> on this glowingly hopeful note, we will go out into, into the night. I do want to quickly, uh, quickly plug that General Intellect's Mackenzie Work's most recent publication is widely available and looks at 21 living thinkers um, and is a really great introduction to these ideas or a way to go deeper there. Lester's book, Knocking the Hustle, is also out. If you've not already read it, shame on you. Um, please pick it up. And the next two conversations in this series, um, the next one will be October 13th and we'll look at trolling and fake news with Matt Gertson and Lisa Snowden McRae. Um, oh, wow. yeah. yeah, so so we will continue building upon this conversation. That's not gonna be an hour, right? It's gonna be more than an hour? <laughs> it's again an hour. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then November 17th, uh, we will talk about universal basic income and its implications in the public health world with Whitney Mallet and Dr. Lena Wen. So I hope you'll join us then. Um, and thank you so much to Mackenzie and Lester for being with us here tonight. Thank you all. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, BMA. Thank you, Baltimore. Thank you very much. Thank you.